Okay, good morning. Sorry, I'm post night. So uh, sorry if I can't speak English. So I'm happy today to talk about um, how to become a master of life scope innovation because I think it's an important topic, especially now with all the COVID that we've had and, you know, the quasi um, exclusive use of Glidescope for intubations lately. So let's discuss on how we can become masters of this. Uh, let me hide this. Good. So today the objective of the presentation is going to be a very short one. It's to identify what are the potential pitfalls of a Glidescope intubation and try to be able to name some of the tips of uh, troubleshooting measures that you can use if you're having trouble with your Glidescope intubation in the near future. If you have questions, um, just uh, open your mic and let me know because I basically remove all the rest so I can see. Um, I must admit I really love Glidescope. It's actually, I will say, I'm in love with Glidescope and since I've been a resident I always like to use Glidescope because not only I can know exactly where I'm going, I find it is a little bit less traumatic uh, than using a, the traditional laryngoscope and I don't know, I find it slick and it usually goes pretty well. But there's a dark side to Glidescope. And I'm going to show you right now a video to, that explains very well what you can encounter when you decide to use Glidescope and you're not, you don't have much experience. So although it's such a cool device and we all love it, remind, uh, remember that it's not always that easy to use. So let's have a look at it. Paralyzed, is it paralyzed? Okay. Okay, go. And I'm going to slip in here. There's a cord. No. Okay. Okay, so that, that was a, a very long video. I don't know if you guys noticed, but this, uh, this was a minute and uh, 10 seconds long and the, the intubation was still not successful. So I'd like to give you my first pearl of the talk, which is not a tip, but mostly a pearl. You have to practice. So Glidescope is like any other thing. You really have to practice to become good at it. And then you should start first using it for the routine cases. So those trauma intubation that you think are gonna be very easy, the intoxicated drunk person that uh, you think is going to be anticipated an easy airway. And then you go to the difficult airways, the bad mandibular, mandibular um, abnormality, uh, the person who has no neck, no chin, and no cervical motion. Uh, this is where you want to use it after. And then you become a glycoscope master because you basically encounter, uh, encounter multiple scenarios where you were able to uh, troubleshoot. So don't forget that you need to practice even though it's one of those uh, devices that are interior is a little bit easier to use. So let's go over the procedure together. So keeping the video in mind, we're going to try to separate or decorticate basically that video and that procedure to try to come up with a certain approach to Glidescope intubation. So there are really four steps to a Glidescope intubation. And the first one is to look in the mouth. So to introduce your laryngoscope or your Glidescope blade, look in the mouth first and make sure you're not inserting it blindly hurting the lips, hurting the teeth, or um, hitting the tongue with your laryngoscope. Once you're gonna have a successful introduction of your scope, look at the screen. You wanna try to obtain the best glutic view you can before you go and insert your tube. Step number three, I think is the number one, it's actually the, the one that we always miss. You wanna look in the mouth when you introduce your ET tube uh, for multiple reasons. First, again, you don't wanna do any trauma by blindly introducing your tube uh, forcefully when you're not really looking at where you're actually introducing it. 
but also because you want to make sure that you're not rubbing that um, little balloon at the end of the ET tube against the teeth because this is where you can actually pierce the balloon and then once you try to inflate and your tube is in and is about a difficult intubation you don't want to be replacing it like uh, five minutes after and then at the end, you want to look at your screen again to be able to see if you passed the, the ET tube successfully between the cords. So four critical steps. You look in the mouth, you look at the screen, you look at the mouth again, and then you look at your screen again. So pitfall number one. The pitfall number one is that we're going to have a look at the video. You see the cords, just like in the video. You see the cords very well, actually, but you cannot to get the tube into the mouth. And look how he is struggling, or he or she, but I think it's a he, struggling to just try to insert that tube in the mouth. He actually needs some help from another person. The tip here is that your blade might either be inserted too far, but most of the time it's because your blade is taking all the space in the mouth. So if you do a midline insertion, and that's actually how you should, in theory, do the glide scope intubation. So you take your blade, you go in the midline, you're going to get a fantastic laryngeal view, but you're going to have very limited space to introduce your tube at the corner of the mouth. So my little tip is that do a modified insertion. You can go midline, but then shift it to the left. You're going to have an adequate laryngeal view. Yes, it's not going to be right in the middle of your screen, but you're still going to see the same image. It's just going to be shifted to the side, and you're going to have a lot more space for your ET tube insertion, as you can see on the right of your screen. So shift it to the left is my number one tip. Pitfall number two, let's have a look at that short video again. So again, you have that great view, right? We see the nice cords, but look at this. Your tube keeps hitting uh, the arytenoids. So you're not able to put it through the cords. And honestly, be honest guys, that's the most common things we encounter. We see very well. And then you ask that crack rate pressure. And in theory, with the glide scope, you should really not, you really shouldn't be needing this crack rate pressure. So you keep hitting the cords or right behind the cords. What can you do here to help? And you can see that in the video, this is where he struggles the most. It, it takes him about 40 seconds until he's actually able to do something else to troubleshoot it. Tip number two is pull your scope back. We're very eager to go and intubate and have that great view of the cords uh, right at the camera level. But then when your scope is too far, you're basically taking all the space for, your, for you to be able to maneuver your ET tube. So tip number two is back up your scope by one to two centimeter. That's gonna allow you to expand your visual field. So you're gonna see a lot better uh, the entrance of your ET tube. Maybe you're not gonna have as good as a view of the cords, but that's okay. You still wanna have some space to be able to see what you're doing with your tube. Um, it's gonna also improve your approach angle because again, you're creating a little bit more space. So pull back your scope. Uh, I'm sure you've heard of the concept of epiglottoscopy. So that's the concept of taking your blade and inserting it in the vellicula and not necessarily putting it under the epi uh, epiglottis that will basically help you to push up all the soft tissue of the base of the tongue and the and the, the the larynx and lift up the epiglottis so you can actually see right below the cords instead of just lifting the whole thing including the um, epiglottis that's the concept that the ron walls keeps talking about so here we have the ideal view that you'd like to have with your glide scope you can see that it's not that close, right? You're a little bit further away, but that's what you want. Why? Because again, you have, you have a lot more space for you to be able to maneuver um, the ET tube all the way to the cords. Good? Very good. So my tip number three. So when you see, I'm just going to go back two seconds, that you are struggling like this. So your tube keeps hitting the arytenoids, it's really not working. Even though you've tried your best and you pull back the scope, uh, you still won't have, you're not able to pass the, cord, the tube through the cord. What can you do? Tip number three is make sure your ET tube is shaped like a hockey stick. So you hockey fans, that's perfect. The trick, let's say you don't have the rigid stylet that comes with the glide scope, because when you have the rigid stylet of the glide scope, that's perfect, just use this. But when you don't, you can shape the stylet like a hockey stick. So you're going to go with a 90 degree angle, about eight centimeter from the distal end of the tube. This is really where you do your mark. 
So let's say you have an RT that's not used to do this, well, do it yourself. So 90 degree, eight centimeter from the distal end of the tube. And that's of course, when you have that malle malleable stylet, not when you have the rigid light scope stylet, which is honestly, I think the best. Tip number four, again, thinking about the fact that you're not able to put the tube through the cords, is that try to optimize your maneuverability. I can never say that word. The perfect insertion technique, you have to hold your tube at the, dis at the, at the proximal end, okay? Not too, not too far below. You really want to hold it there. What is it going to do? It's going to help you being able to rotate the tube. And that is really, if you have to rem remind one thing about that present, uh, remember one thing about that presentation is that this is the key. You want to be able to rotate the tube easily to be able to really put it through the cords. Um, that's it. And the insertion, I hope I have a picture about this. Yes, so we're going to have a look at it here. This is the perfect insertion technique. Look at how he's entering with the um, ET tube. Very good. So the ET tube, if we go back to the video, I'm just gonna go back here. And I'm gonna pause it right here. So removing that little plastic thing. And I'm gonna stop right here. So see his approach angle. He's basically entering the tube rotated. So the tip is actually aiming to the right cheek or right side of the mouth. He's not entering midline with the tip pointing up. It's really pointing towards the cheek. And that's really, really important. Once you've entered here, we're going to be looking at the screen. I'm not sure in the video if they're going to show the screen. Yes, they are. Look at the approach angle, how different it is. You're going to be coming with a superior approach. And then you're going to be right in the cords. While in the other videos, when you enter midline, you're basically aiming posteriorly to the cord. So the trick here is really to enter with the, t the, um, the ET tube in the rotation and then holding it at the proximal hand, you're just gonna have to turn like this, like a little bit, and then it's gonna really go through the cords easily. Pitfall number three. You're in, so you are, uh, have successfully done all those maneuvers. You've entered with the right approach angle. You've created some space with your glide scope. You're in the cords, but you're not able to put it through the cords. And that happens all the time. And it is actually normal because that's the whole nature of the glide scope, but also the rigid stylet. When that happens, you have to stop, pop the stylet, and drop your ET2. So basically what you do is you're going to say, okay, I'm at the cords or right above the cords, you're gonna ask your RT. I usually, what I say is I say, please remove the stylet. And as someone is removing the stylet, I am dropping the tube or pushing it down with less of a sharp angle. And it's basically gonna go to the cords uh, without any problem. But you really have to remove the stylet as you're pushing the tube through the cord. So the stop, pop and drop, that's gonna permit you to really intubate successfully. Very good, so we're basically done. Uh, I wanna just try to, you know, usually it's more interactive, but uh, if you can get the tube, the tube into the mouth, you have to shift the scope to the left, make some space for you to be able to intubate. If you can get the tube through the cords, there's multiple things that you can do, right? Pull it back, so pull back your scope to create some more space. Make sure you have either this, the rigid stylet that comes with the glide scope, or shake it, shape your ET tube like a hockey stick. And finally, most important tip, in my opinion, make sure you're able to optimize your maneuverability. So get a proximal grip and also enter on an horizontal axis. So then you can actually twist it after when you're right above the cords. And finally, if you're stuck at the cords, don't remember the stop, pop, and drop technique that's really gonna help you getting a successful, easy peasy intubation. Uh, that is a quote. So I remember when I did that presentation, I was actually still in residency. And I, that was after EA, listening to an EM rap um, uh, podcast, where Ron was, well, was basically saying, advocating that we should always be using the video laryngoscopy for our patient because it, it's in their best interest. And I kind of agree with him. But I think you still need to be expert in both techniques. And I'll tell you why. When I, uh, maybe not the, the Jewish, but sometimes in certain hospital in the, let's say, Valley Field where I work, you'll be called for a code on the floor. You don't have glide scope on the floors. So when you decide to intubate a patient because there's a crashing airway, 
or uh, I don't know, they're in cardiac arrest and you're there in your sequence that you need to intubate, there's no glide scope. So you need to be comfortable intubating with a uh, direct laryngoscope. So I think you need to be expert in both techniques. Yet, I think it's very important that I think the glide scope has become very important in our practice and we can see it with COVID and you need to practice to become good at it. Uh, are there any questions? And I'm going to stop sharing my screen to see something. Okay. Any questions? There's one, one question or one comment here from Dr. Deschamps-Play. Uh, maybe you can comment on the fact that not all glide scope are the same. Uh, the disposable blade is very different than the non-disposable one. Do you have anything to? About that. that is a good comment. I honestly I think in both hospitals that I worked, uh, both of them, uh, I think all of them are disposable. I don't think I've worked with the non-disposable. In South Africa, I think maybe I've worked with it, but I don't really remember. Uh, you have to um, rem you have to remember that the let's see the CMAC is completely different. That's another type of video laryngoscopy that has a different shape of blade. But even the CMAC um, device might have the, a very hyperangulated blade like the, um, the glide scope. So there's multiple various things. Um, I'm not really sure. I didn't really encounter the different types of um, disposable, non-disposable blade. And maybe, Francois, if you have more experience, you can definitely add on, on this topic. But uh, do you guys feel like it's uh, exactly because that's what happens, right? You're always hitting the arytenoids on the posterior aspect of the cords. I don't know if you guys can hear me. Um, yeah. Yeah, so my comment was uh, we, we used to have a non-disposable blade that we changed for a disposable one at the MGH during the, uh, the pandemic. Uh, hopefully, we'll get our non-disposable blade back. Very different blades, um, much thinner than the non-disposable uh, one and also more angulated. So the regular, well, the, the regular, I don't know if it's the good word, but the disposable blade um, will get you by for most of the intubation and most of the, I would say, regular difficult intubation. But for the very difficult intubation, much better view with the uh, thinner and more angulated blades. So ideally, if um, a, an emergency would get two glide scope, I would highly suggest that you have uh, one of each. The downside of the non-disposable blade is that usually you lose the blade uh, for cleaning for a few hours when it's sent away from the emergency. So you don't want to overuse that because you probably only have uh, one or two blades in the department uh, at a single time. Um, but uh, it's, a, it's a much, much better tool. Some of our anesthesiologists actually uh, do not want to use the... Uh, disposable blades because they feel it's a it's a crappy blade so just just um my little two cents on that thank you very much um any other questions another quick question laura it's will yeah. hi uh, i didn't maybe i missed it uh, difficulty getting the tube in did you mention sometimes rotating it counterclockwise or because it, it's hitting the rings of the trachea and uh did you say that i i uh, not that's a good idea. So once you're in the cords, um, yeah. uh, it's uh, what's his name, Kovacs, uh, the yes. guy from Halifax. He mentions yeah. that so sometimes when you don't have the right approach angle, you're a little bit too angulated, and when you're going to enter your, let's say that's the trachea, and you enter your tube a little bit with this angle, um, and then one of the trick is actually to rotate a bit, and when you're rotating, you're going to have a bit of a better approach for you to drop your tube. And really be able to fully insert in the codes. That's a that's a very good point, Will. You know what I'm gonna do? Um, I this this uh, presentation was based on an article published in um, I think it's Academic Emergement or something that I'm gonna all send to you. But I'm also gonna send that little um, glide scope blurb of uh, Kovacs on this. And this tip is also mentioned. It's an extra tip, but that's a very good point, Will. That will definitely help you to try to. So that rotation that you have when you're holding it proximal is such a good tip for you to be able to better maneuver, not only to approach your cords, but when you're in the cord to try to push in the tube. It's a very good comment. Good. So you're going to all master your intubations. 
Thank you very much for your invitation. Excellent. Thanks, Laurie. That was super useful.